Through Isaiah, Jehovah spoke of the need to untie and snap every yoke, setting free those burdened and weighed down. Christ described regulations and prohibitions arbitrarily imposed by religious authorities as heavy burdens, and his disciples recognized that even the law had been a yoke difficult to bear. Legalism and insistent pressures to perform specified activities and to observe imposed prohibitions with failure to conform, creating the heaviness of guilt, continue to this day. Matthew chapter 23 says, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the seat of Moses. Therefore all the things they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say but do not perform. They bind up heavy loads and put them upon the shoulders of men, but they themselves are not willing to budge them with their finger. Beginning in 1964, Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi experienced unprecedented persecution, brutality, violence, savage mobs, etc. Also in 1967, 1972, and 1975. Families had homes burned or demolished, crops destroyed. In 1967, there were rapings of over 1,000 women, one mother being violated by six different men, her 13-year-old daughter by three men. At least 40 had miscarriages due to this. There were beatings, torture, even murder. Yet children died, be and young children died because of lack of medicine or medical treatment. Why did all of these nightmares occur? For the Jehovah's Witnesses? Because the Jehovah's Witnesses were forbidden by their organization to purchase a party card of the ruling political party. That is, they couldn't if they wanted to remain loyal to the Watchtower and not lose their eternal salvation. Because we all know the organization threatens that if we don't believe exactly what and, what and do exactly what they say, that we can't live forever. Because you have to be an accepted member of the Watchtower Society, according to it, to be saved. The Society said that it would compromise their neutrality and make them unfaithful to God. As Ray points out in his awesome book, to be a citizen of any country is to be a member of a political state. The extent to which one succumbs to its demands may vary, but the membership is still a fact. Paul told us to be submissive to governments even though they can be corrupt. That doesn't mean everything political is inherently evil, otherwise God wouldn't have told us to submit at all. It's citiz is citizenship inherently bad? If not, then why should a corporation be able to tell those in Malawi they couldn't possess a card, even at all costs like death, rape, plundering, violence, etc.? To quote Ray, If a person could be a citizen and hence a member of the national political community without violating integrity to God, where was the evidence that being submissive to the government's insistence that everyone purchase a card of the ruling party would constitute such a violation of integrity to God. How major is the difference? How would Christians in the first century have viewed it in light of the Apostles' exhortation, render to all their dues, to him who calls for the tax, the tax, to him who calls for the tribute, the tribute, to him who calls for fear, such fear, to him who calls for honor, such honor. It's one thing for something to disturb your personal Christian conscience and to then refuse it at all costs. It's another to have some corporation dictate your conscience in order to remain saved and unshunned and loved by those you love most. That kind of imposition of conscience is awful, especially given some scriptural support for actually submitting to the political state's request. They didn't ask them to kill anyone or something that God would clearly find abominable, like worshiping a man or a statue. Now let's examine more Watchtower Society hypocrisy at work. At the same time all these Malawi nightmares were occurring, Jehovah's Witness men in Mexico were given permission to bribe military officials to complete a certificate falsely stating that they had fulfilled them their military service obligations. After obtaining this certificate from bribing, these witnesses were then placed in the first reserve of the military. This is clearly inconsistent with organizational standards, as well as bribing and such a clear violation of God's principles. I'm not judging the men who did this here, just exposing how Jehovah's Witnesses' organizational loyalty can make them succumb to whatever they're told by an elite few men in New York. To quote Ray, the Witnesses in Malari risked life and limb, homes and lands, 
to adhere to the stance adopted by the organization for their country. In Mexico, there was no such risk involved, yet a policy of the utmost leniency was applied. Their witnessmen could be members of the first reserves of the army and yet be circuit or district overseers, members of the Bethel family. Keep in mind, this is a society publishing corporation that actually forbid substitutionary service as opposed to military service. Yet somehow they found bribing and having certificates of military service fulfillment and enrollment in the First Reserve perfectly okay. Talk about double standards and handling the sheep carelessly, arbitrarily, and sadly. To quote Ray, when I brought up the matter, I heard no expression of dismay at the disparity in the standard applied in Malawi and the one applied in Mexico. Most of the members apparently found they could accept the Mexico policy while simultaneously insisting upon a totally different standard for people elsewhere. I do not think the matter simply resolves down to personalities, the individual members involved. I've come to the conclusion that this outlook is in reality a typical product of any authority structure to see double standards exist without feeling strong qualms of conscience. Then Ray goes on to say that brothers in Mexico were disturbed by these double standards in their consciences because of the suffering in Malawi, but that those in Brooklyn at the top in the so-called Ivory Tower, however, seemed strangely detached from such feelings, insensitive to the consequences to people from such double standards. This, too, I believe is an effect of the system, which is one reason I find such a system personally repelling. He goes on to point out this insensitizing effect organizational loyalty can produce is well documented throughout the centuries, from the Inquisition to the Nazi regime. It is sickening and disconcerting. We're talking about blood guilt here, lives destroyed, people affected, rape, torture, death, etc. Should organizational interests be more important than the interests of ordinary people? Are men in charge and their consciences somehow superior to the common man's.